you're watching in the virtual studio here at Davis Media Access. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Autumn Labbe Renault, and today joining me is Dr. Amy Sisson, the Health Officer for Yolo County. It's good to see you again, Dr. Sisson. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Autumn. So I mentioned this to you, but over the last few weeks, um, I've had moderators from the big uh, COVID-19 community response group on Facebook who they, they just won an award from the city. They've done a fabulous job helping people during the pandemic. But they came to me and said, we're getting questions. We have no idea how to answer and we're having trouble rounding up answers. Can you help? Which is when I reached out to you. So I thought this was a good moment in the pandemic where we are now to kind of check in with some Q&A with you. So let's start with an overview of where we are in Yolo County and how we're doing right now. In particular, let's talk about these terms. Community level is medium, but community transmission is high. And then there's been news about the high levels of COVID appearing in our wastewater locally. So let's start with kind of defining those terms and, and tell us how we're doing right now. Sure. Well, um, the, the terms COVID-19 community level and community transmission are two different frameworks that the CDC has put together um, to, to help assess where a community is at in terms of COVID. Community transmission is the first metric that CDC use, and we've talked about that for um, the almost the entire pandemic. That is based on the case rate as well as the testing positivity rate. Um, and that's how much disease is circulating in the, the community. It's no measure of the severity of the disease. It's just the, the number of, of cases and the proportion of people who are testing positive. That is in fact high right now in Yolo County. That's based on the mm -hmm. fact that our case rate, rate right now is 30.2 per 100,000 residents per day. Um, that qualifies as high community transmission. Um, on the, the other side, the newer metric that the CDC has put together is something called the COVID-19 community level. That's only been around for a couple of months, and that was developed during the Omicron wave in recognition of the fact that while we had really high case rates, there weren't necessarily a lot of people ending up in the hospital. And so they wanted to come up with a metric that took into account the burden on the healthcare system um, caused mm -hmm. by COVID-19. And so the COVID-19 community level is based on the case rate as well as how many new admissions there are for COVID-19 in the hospital and the proportion of people who are hospitalized who are there for, for COVID. That in Yolo County is currently at the medium level. The CDC mm -hmm. has a, an entire set of recommendations that are based on the COVID-19 community level. Um, for high community level, which we are not at, for example, they recommend that everybody wears a mask indoors. For the medium community level where we are, they recommend that more vulnerable individuals wear masks indoors. Yeah. However, the state of California has taken a more protective approach and they recommend that everybody um, right now wear masks indoors. That's a strong recommendation coming from the, the state. So that's the difference between the COVID-19 community level and community transmission. You'll hear me most often talking about community transmission because right. I'm thinking about how can we, uh, when and, and how is the, the time to talk about people protecting themselves because there's more virus circulating in the community and the community transmission level is the best metric for that. When we're looking at what are some uh, restrictions that we may want to put in place in terms of a masking mandate, for example, that's where mm -hmm. we're going to want to look at what is the burden on the healthcare system and is that high enough to justify um, added restrictions such as a mask mandate. So that's where we'll look at the COVID-19 community level instead of community transmission. Right. And you and I have talked numerous times during the pandemic, and you've always said that you know, you're very clear that you follow the public health recommendations from both the, the CDC and the, the California Department of Public Health. And so when the masking mandate was lifted here in Yolo County, that was you doing exactly that, following the, the, the guidance from the state and the federal level. The number one question I'm getting from parents right now, this is hitting parents of, of with kids in the K through 12 system is, why can't we go back to masking mandates and why can't we do it for the end of the school year because our family cannot seem to get out from under this cycle of being infected, you know, and then the whole family getting infected. So the key there is, is what you just said, it has to do with the 
the severity and, uh, and the impact on the healthcare system itself. Exactly. Um, and, you know, I think we'll talk more about this, but the fact that we aren't requiring people to wear masks does not mean that an individual cannot choose to protect themselves by wearing a mask. And one-way masking, which is you as an individual wearing a mask, regardless of what the people around you are doing, can be highly protective, especially if that mask is a high quality mask that fits well and filters well, like an N95, KN95, mm -hmm. or KF94. Um, so mm -hmm. a student or a parent can feel confident that they're um, loved one is well protected if they themselves are wearing that high quality mask, regardless of what folks around them are doing. Yeah, I guess I'm natively cautious and I'm also, you know, I care about the, my community, the people around me. I, I had an experience the other night, well, two things. I know more people sick with COVID right now than I have in the rest of the pandemic combined. For most of them, not all, but for most, they've, if they've had vaccines and boosters, the cases are mild, but it's not, that's not uniform. I, I attended a, an, a city reception earlier this week that was outdoors, but it was very crowded. And after that, I went inside to the city council meeting, which resumed in-person meetings for the, the first time on this Tuesday. And, um, in all cases, I was pretty surprised how few people were masking. I kept my mask on the whole time just because, I, like I said, I'm sort of natively cautious and, and wanting to still do what's right. No one in Davis questioned me, but I've had the experience of going elsewhere in Yolo County recently and people actually harassing me for wearing a mask. And so um, it comes down to personal choice. It comes down to personal fortitude but i'm hearing you say one of the best things we can still do is to to mask where where possible and where when we're around a lot of other people yes yeah i, I mean the the state of california strongly recommends that everybody wear wears a mask indoors right now and i support that my my own behavior i've resumed masking indoors and i don't eat indoors in in restaurants because that would require taking taking my mask off and being exposed i think your observation that you know more people who are sick now with with covid than than ever before um is an accurate one. Um, it's not reflected in our case rates, but we know that those case rates are an underestimate of reality right mm -hmm. now. The case rate is based on PCR confirmed infections. A lot of people right now are testing with home tests. And even if you right. report a home test result to the county, like we prefer, it's still not going to show up in the case rate because it's uh, antigen tests are only considered probable or suspect cases by the state and federal criteria. So they don't show up in the, in the case rate. So there's a lot of cases that are either not being reported because they're home antigen tests or they are being reported as antigen tests that don't show up in that case rate. And that's where we look to the wastewater to give us a, a sense of what's happening. Wastewater doesn't require you to test or to report a test result. Um, everybody who's connected to the sewage system are, is submitting a sample on a regular basis for wastewater right. detection. And uh, we have seen um, those levels increasing across Yellow County. We, ha we have daily numbers that are reported in near real time for the city of Davis through uh, SCAN, the uh, sewer coronavirus uh, alert network through, through Stanford. Um, and those numbers, if you look at the absolute values of, of wastewater signals are nearly as high now as they were at the peak of the Omicron wave in, in January. So wow. our case rate right now is 30 it, countywide. Our peak case rate in January was 242. So the fact that the wastewater levels are almost as high as they were in January could mean that our actual case rate now is in the 200s and not the 30 that we're reporting. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for circling back to the, the wastewater question. Um, I am going to move us on to testing because there have been uh, various questions coming through. First, I'd like to really, I'm personally confused and I've heard a lot of confusion because the recommendations for how long you should isolate after testing positive, all of that shifted a while back. So please tell us if someone tests positive now, what is the protocol that they, they should be following? 
Yeah, so the duration of isolation, which is how long an infected person should, should stay home and away from others, um, is based on whether they get a test during their isolation period. So the if somebody tests positive, that counts as day zero, the day that they either the day that their symptoms started or if they had no symptoms, the day of their test is day zero. Um, the minimum amount of time that somebody has to isolate for when infected is five days. Um, if on day five, they take an antigen test and that antigen test is negative, then on day six, they can resume uh, their normal life. Although we ask them to wear a mask when they're around others um, through mm -hmm. day 10. If somebody does not choose to get a second test um, after, on day five or later, or doesn't have access to a second test, then they need to stay in isolation for a full 10 days. So that would mean they leave isolation on day 11. Mm -hmm. I have had friends tell me they were still testing positive at day 12 or day 13. That, so is that a possibility? That's a thing that happens. That is a that is a possibility. Um, we don't ask them to continue their isolation at that point. Um, we really the, that second antigen test is to be completed between day five and nine. If you make it to, to day 10, you do not need to test at the end of isolation. Um, okay. At that point, we think even the individuals who are testing positive are very unlike are unlikely to be infectious. Um, so we are not asking people to test again after after day 10. That test is between day five and nine to shorten your isolation. You can leave on, on day 11 without another test. If you do okay. choose to test again on day 12 and it's positive, then you're in a, a tricky spot trying to figure out what, what to do. Um, there, right. There's no clear guidance from the state or the federal government at that point. Um, so you can choose to continue isolation for a, a couple of days and test again, or it would be fine for you to return to your, your normal activities because based on testing that the CDC has done to see if individuals who are still testing positive on antigen 10, 10 12 days later are actually infectious has shown that most of them are not. Okay, okay. That's helpful clarification, thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to some of the other testing questions that have come in. One was with Healthy Davis Together testing set to end at the end uh, at, at the end of June. What will people's testing options in Yolo County be like um, after that date in June? And another question was, what is the county going to do to continue to ensure access to to testing, especially for school age kids? Now that question, to be fair, I noticed just a couple days that the county did start a, a clinic for families that fell outside of school hours to better accommodate some of the requests you were getting. But um, let's tackle those testing questions. What, what's going to happen after June? What are our options going to look like? Yeah, um, and, and I definitely think those those two questions are are connected. Um, Healthy Yolo Together testing has been a wonderful resource in in Yolo County. It's free. It gives fast results. It does not involve a, a nasal swab. Um, so we've all fallen in in love with it. Uh, but all good things must must end, and there will still be testing in Yolo County after Healthy Yolo Together ends um, on June thirtieth. Uh, we're going to be shifting to a focus that's primarily based on home antigen testing. Home antigen tests are widely available um, for free um, for uh, directly from the federal government. Every household has been eligible for three rounds of, of home tests, including this latest third round where a household can get eight tests uh, as opposed to the previous four. So that's one source of home antigen tests. Uh, individuals who are insured, which of course everyone is required to, to be insured under the Affordable Care Act, um, or to pay a tax penalty. Um, individuals with insurance can get reimbursed from their insurance company for up to eight tests per member per, per month. And then some insurance companies have partnered with retail pharmacies to provide the tests for free so that there's no out-of-pocket cost um, for the individual. For example, Kaiser members can go to Costco and show their Kaiser card and uh, at the pharmacy and receive 
uh, antigen tests for, for free um, without having to do any paperwork for reimbursement. So that's one source of home antigen tests. We also, the county is receiving home antigen tests from the state that we are working with community-based organizations to distribute to our um, most disproportionately impacted and disadvantaged communities. Um, as part of this emphasis on home antigen testing post June 30th, we're also working on a, a pilot project at the county uh, to put a couple of vending machines into disadvantaged neighborhoods that would uh, offer free home antigen tests um, in the machine, uh, no money required, no code required, um, and those would be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, so that an individual who doesn't otherwise have access to a home antigen test uh, would be able to, to get this for free at any time of day. In addition to this broadening availability of home antigen tests, there will still be PCR and other professional antigen testing available in Yolo County. We have an OptumServe uh, testing site that's sponsored by the state in Woodland um, next to the juvenile detention facility. That will continue after June 30th. That is now a test to treat clinic. So I think we're gonna talk more about that in a minute in terms of making antivirals more available, uh, but it, it it offers testing to everybody in Yellow County. So that is one option. And then healthcare providers continue to offer um, testing for symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. So it, it will require people to step outside their comfort zone a little bit and try a new testing mm -hmm. site. Um, people have gotten very comfortable with the tremendous resource that Healthy Yolo Together offers, uh, but yeah. there will still be uh, testing available in Yolo County for free um, after June 30th. Good news. And in fact, my very next question was, let's talk about the, the test to treat pilot at that OptumServe Optum site. So tell us a little bit more about that, please. Yeah, we're really excited about this because it's a one-stop shop for COVID testing um, assessment by a physician and then treatment with an antiviral if somebody qualifies. So uh, the way it works is an individual um, makes an appointment or shows up at the OptumServe testing site in, in Woodland, they get an antigen test, they get the, that result with, within an hour, and then if they um, are interested in antiviral treatment, they do an on-site assessment with the nurse and a telehealth visit with a physician um, inside the, the OptumServe clinic. And if they qualify, so this is going to be individuals who are 65 and older and anyone with an underlying condition that puts them at increased risk for severe disease, and assuming they don't have any contraindications in terms of uh, kidney failure, liver failure, or other medications that they're, they're taking that are compatible with Paxlovid, then they'll receive a prescription for, or they, they get prescribed Paxlovid, but they don't have to go to a pharmacy to pick it up. They have the Paxlovid right there at the OptumServe site. So the individual walks out the door with the five-day supply of, of Paxlovid um, and mm -hmm. they are all set. So this, everything happens under one roof um, within, mm -hmm. you know, hours um, of the patient showing up and, and getting their diagnosis as, as positive. So it's really eliminating the barrier of somebody having to make an appointment with their regular provider, that provider being comfortable prescribing Paxlovid, which does have some interactions with other drugs. Um, and so it allows people to get treatment faster, which is important because Paxlovid in particular needs to be started within five days of somebody's symptoms uh, developing. And so it is a quick timeline in order to make it, you know, to feel sick enough that you think you need a COVID test to get that test result, for it to be positive, to make an appointment with your provider, um, to get in to see that provider and then pick up pick up a prescription at a pharmacy. Sometimes it's hard to get all that done in a five day period, but having a test to treat yeah. site streamlines all those steps under one roof and really makes it possible to get this very effective treatment in the hands of of our residents. Uh, Paxlovid has been shown to be 90% effective in, in keeping people out of the hospital if it's started within five days of their symptoms beginning. Hmm. I, I wanna come back to Paxlovid and, and, and the antivirals in, in just a second. Um, does the county have plans to open any more test to treat sites? Right now we have the one site in, in Woodland, correct? 
Correct. At, at this point, we do not have plans, but we are working with the major healthcare providers and health systems in Yolo County, um, encouraging them to streamline access to Paxlovid. So while they may not be a, a true test to treat site under the state and federal definitions, anything that they can do that makes it easy easier for the, the patients in their care to get into a provider and get a prescription for Paxlovid, um, the better. We have plenty of pharmacies in the community that offer that have Paxlovid on, on hand. So what we need to do is make it easier for the patients to get the prescription for Paxlovid. And so we are working with uh, the health systems in Yolo County to try to streamline that as much as possible. Okay, great. I think you addressed um, a couple of the questions that came in about what is medically appropriate in terms of pla Paxlovid, there we go. Um, and you you identified the age and the underlying conditions and, and the things to screen for. But one other question is, we're hearing about the, the rebound effect from, from uh, Paxlovid. Can you speak to that for just a minute? What is that? How many people, what percentage of the population that's been infected seems to be presenting with that? Yeah, so we are seeing, um, uh, in, 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 well, an instance uh, of individuals who have taken Paxlovid um, because they had symptoms, uh, who then tested negative, their symptoms Im improved, and then a few days later, uh, they have symptoms show up again, and they test for, for COVID, and they're positive again. So this is considered um, Paxlovid or, or antiviral COVID-19 rebound. Um, we've just gotten some new guidance from the CDC that indicates that an individual who does develop uh, recurrent symptoms at, and or a new positive test after completing their five-day course of Paxlovid should isolate again. There have been a couple instances of transmission of these individuals who have recurrent symptoms or recurrent positive tests. So they are potentially infectious again. And so we ask them to, to stay home for another five-day isolation period. Um, there's no need at this point for them to extend uh, the duration of Paxlovid treatment. It's only approved as a, as a five-day course. Um, and to be clear, these are not considered treatment failures. For uh, By and large, uh, the patients who are having recurrent symptoms or recurrent positive tests after Paxlovid are, are definitely in, in the minority. Uh, it's a, right, it's a right. single digit percentage and their symptoms are mild. So we aren't aware of individuals who have had recurrent symptoms or recurrent positivity who've ended up in the hospital. And that is the goal of Paxlovid. It's not a cure for, for COVID-19 okay. infection. It is a treatment that minimizes the severity of disease. And it's even with these rebound cases, these individuals are not ending up in the hospital. So we consider them to be successful antiviral treatments. Great. Yeah, there's always going to be a few outliers with any any condition, any and especially in, in a in a pandemic as we're experiencing. Okay, I'm going to move on to a couple of the questions that came through from those parents of the the K through 12 kids. Um, the first question was, what can the county do to increase vaccination rates for and availability and accessibility for the age five to 11 age group? So let's start with that. Yeah, so I think there's interest in the five to 11 age group right now because boosters were just authorized and recommended last week. Um, so things were a little chaotic in the first couple of days as they always are after that authorization yeah. and recommendation came through. Um, first, the FDA authorizes it, then a day or two later, the CDC recommends, and then we still need to wait for Western states and CDPH to give the blessing to administer the, those boosters in, in California. So I, I think some of the, the first individuals uh, who are anxious to, to get boosters for their five to 11 year olds got caught up in some of that transition of 
clinics needing to adjust their, their protocols to expand eligibility to, to include a booster for five to 11. So I think now we're, we're in our first full week of administering boosters to five to 11 year olds. And so the process should be much, much smoother. Um, the county um, has been offering two vaccine clinics a week on Thursday and Friday. We were offering those clinics, uh, I believe our times were between 12 and 2 p.m. We did mm -hmm. get requests from the community um, particularly now that boosters are available for age 5 to 11, uh, to move those outside of school hours so that parents would not need yeah. to take their kids out of school and parents who are working could remain at work. So we have, for this week, we have shifted those clinics. And I think ongoing, we'll move those clinics into the late afternoon, early evening to accommodate students and, and parents. So we're, we're doing everything we can as the, the county with our relatively small clinics um, to support families, but we're also encouraging families to seek vaccination through their regular health care provider, as well as at retail pharmacies. They have the vaccine in stock. So it's not like in the beginning um, of the vaccine rollout when Yola County was really the only player in town who had the vaccine. So we want to encourage families to start with their regular place of care when it comes to getting a COVID-19 vaccine. And if they aren't able to get in quickly or their provider doesn't have vaccines, then certainly the, the county is, is available. But we're more of a of a, a second resort than a, than a first uh, go-to. Right. I saw an interesting news article um, from Kaiser this week who was promoting vaccine clinics for non-members. You don't have to be a Kaiser member. Just come on by and we'll, we'll get you vaccinated. So it does seem that there's there's a, a push at this point um, from some of the providers as well to to jump in there, and and I think that's great. As as you well know, so much of public health is about uh, lowering those barriers to to accessibility. So this is all good news. I would imagine there'll be a, a similar process when the vaccine for um, for the the five year olds and and uh, the young the the youngest kids is is approved that there'll be we'll be might be having this conversation again about what that looks like so yeah it's looking like the middle of june is when the fda's advisory committee will be meeting to discuss both the pfizer and moderna vaccines for children under five and and under six respectively um and again um i would kind of warn those parents that i know they've been waiting a long time for vaccines to, to be available they're very excited to get vaccinated just a reminder that the first couple days after a vaccine um, is expanded in ineligibility. There can be some delays in one, the clinic having the vaccine on hand, two, uh, appointments being available in the my turn system for that vac vaccine, um, and three, uh, clinics uh, or the state having given that final blessing in the form of the Western State Scientific Safety Review Working Group, even if the FDA and the CDC have signed off on it. So it can take a couple of days for a clinic to be ready. So I would encourage parents, I know they've been waiting a long time, but if you want the smoothest of experience, maybe wait another one to two days for some of the kinks to get worked out to make sure your, your clinic is ready to administer vaccines to, to under five. Don't just show up until you you've heard a green light or an announcement that the clinic is ready to go to administer vaccines to the youngest kids. Well, the one parent shared a kind of a horror story about this last week where um, my turn actually said, okay, come on down. And then when they got there, they were turned away. And her perspective was like, look, my family has the resources and the flexibility to deal with this, but a lot of families don't. So, um, so while she was frustrated, she was more concerned about, about other families, um, you know, who, who aren't in the same situation being more frustrated, but yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Give it a week or two to, to, to flush out and, and then it'll even it just a, get better. Even just a day or two, um, a day or is, two. <laughs> is, is typically, is typically enough for the kinks to get worked out. But of course we want it to be a smooth experience, you know, from, from the get go. Um, but it does okay. often take a day or two to get things running smoothly. Okay. Dr. Susan, I think my final question and it, it i know you're not an epidemiologist so so you know and and i think everyone wants to know when is this going to end and no one can predict that but in in the realm of public health what what is the consensus about how long 
we might be dealing with. So are we talking about a year? Are we, I've heard five years. I've heard, I've heard a lot of different things. So I'm, I'm asking you. I think you've heard a lot of different things because the, the fact of the matter is nobody really knows. Um, we're learning yeah. about this virus as we go. This virus is, is constantly changing. You know, we talk about variants and that's exactly what they are. They're variations on the original virus. Um, the virus is mutating. It's evolving uh, based on, on pressures and opportunities that, that it sees. Um, you know, the virus is getting more transmissible, more, in, more infectious, which is challenging. At the same time, it appears to be causing less severe disease, which is good news. Whether that because the virus itself um, has mutated or simply because we as the human species have built up some immunity through vaccination as well as prior infection. We don't know. Um, so which direction the virus will evolve in, we, we can guess. Um, but, you know, after Delta variant, we would have thought that the next variant would be uh, a variation on Delta. And instead we got Omicron, right. which looks almost nothing like Delta. So what will come next? We don't know. We've been seeing right now, highly infectious variants that are sub variants of Omicron. So they're still causing less severe disease, which is why our hospitalizations are, are very low despite our very high case rates. So we're very grateful for that decoupling, but there's no guarantee that that will last, that the next variant that comes along will not cause more severe disease and overwhelm our our healthcare system. So, so much of what happens next depends on uh, how the virus mutates, and we can't really predict that. Um, it also depends on our behavior. Um, there was a, a very interesting article in, in the New Yorker this week that, that talked about, um, you know, if we decide the pandemic has ended before it's actually ended, we could make things worse. So, you know, pandemic ends, it can end biologically or it can end socially when we decide that we're, we're done caring about it. And the yeah. risk is that if we stop caring about it before the biological pandemic has ended, uh, then we have the possibility for um, a lot of, of ill people, a lot of people getting very sick in overwhelming our hospitals and, and dying in the instance of a very uh, severe uh, variant. So we don't know what the experts are saying is they, the next stage will be endemic in which we are living with COVID. So we don't think that COVID will ever go away entirely. We think eventually it is going to become, you know, something more predictable at a lower level of disease uh, and death than we're seeing now, but we're not there yet. So we're in sort of this limbo um, period uh, where we're going to continue to see surges. We aren't in a steady state. And it's a very frustrating place for all of us to be in. Those of us who are trying to control this, uh, those who mm -hmm. are trying to go back to some semblance of, of normal. So I, I want to acknowledge that the challenge of living in this period of of the unknown and, and of limbo. Um, but unfortunately, it looks like we're gonna be stuck here for at least a, a while and no one can really predict how long. Yeah. I wanna thank you for making time today. I, I know you're very busy. You've been such a resource for all of us in Yolo County during this pandemic and you've been very uh, gracious with your, your time and, and interviews with us. So just thank you. I, I want to direct people to yellowcounty.org as still a, a really kind of a one one stop shop for COVID related info across Yolo County, including the dashboards. When you enter the URL dead center on the homepage, there is a little mask icon that links to all the COVID-19 resources, including those dashboards and statistics and all kinds of things. So please check it out, stay informed and stay safe. You've been watching in the studio here at Davis Media Access. I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel where we have all kinds of community information and interviews and even some fun things like music and storytelling that will help lift your spirits a bit during these times. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Autumn Levy Renault.